Oh, maybe you can hear me. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the last talk for the afternoon. We'll be uh, hearing from Lydia Gottfried about Amazon Chat. Fair warning, this uh, specific talk has been inspired by an uh, unboxing of uh, Casper mattress that we recently got. So it will fit in the box of 30 seconds, but there's going to be a lot. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so let's, let's kind of dive into the whole thing. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a senior dev at Binary Defense, uh, recent recruit, uh, love it, thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, my Twitter handle, IKG underscore agent. Um, I was actually an art agent at one point, so as a side hobby or whatever it was, and so that's how that came about. Uh, Ilya Gabriel is my GitHub handle, and um, let's from there. So the topics we're going to cover. This um, intent for this talk in general is to introduce the full scope of this library on the, and how it fits into the ecosystem, and the fact that you can start with it literally right now, and the fact that you can take it to production and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of the pieces in this talk are going to be guiding posts. They might be you know, a little bit overhead because we're going to dive into security, we're going to dive into uh, you know, how it deploys, and so on and so forth. And so it would be kind of informative for you to say no, it actually does do that, and we're fine, and we can proceed with it into production however we want to play. So uh, the first thing we're going to go into why this route, uh, what's so special about kind of this uh, library, this generally this approach. Then this is mandatory, right? Every token serverless, everybody has their definition of serverless, so we're going to do that. Uh, getting it off the ground, we uh, will just talk through the steps of uh, like what are the basic steps, what are we looking at, just get oriented around it. Um, but my computer is not serverless, right? So it's all great and fun, but we do have you know file of Python laying on our computer. How do we actually test it before we deploy it? We can't, we can't deploy it every time to test it. It's just silly. <coughs> Amazon has you know bought Cloud9, and so they have one for ID and everything. It's not uh, another way. And then what about in real life, right? So that's where we're going to talk about uh, various implications of security and what it actually is capable of doing. Uh, I'm going to be flying past because I'm going to be running late there, so it's going to be great. Uh, and then pros and cons and, cons and hidden obstacles, some of them were very important, were pointed out to me by uh, very important people that I trust, and so um, it's worth mentioning as well. Uh, so why this route? That's uh, Turkey Drive. Um, so um, I really like the quote from uh, Zirian Q guy, completely unrelated to this topic, but the quote for me is kind of rather inspirational. Uh, so this is a science program. Make building blocks that people can understand and use easily and people will work together to solve the very large problems. Right, so you have, you're talking about small functions that you can push out and make available quickly and do everything you need to do with them. It's, it's very kind of within that vein and very kind of inspirational. Um, have you ever seen it get feedback in minutes, right? That's very valuable. We always want to see that happen. Um, don't worry about your sources. Uh, until you have to, so you don't have to go hand in hand, you know, to your ops and go like, could I actually have these resources allocated for me so I could run some proofs of concept? Uh, at the same time, keep framework be your proof of concept. So that's the beauty with the, you know, all the toil that you put in. You can just continue on with it and turn it into a real project. Uh, start building AWS on the serverless apps before you have to learn what it means, <laughs> what it says. <laughs> um, Application-based way of learning by doing again, you know, trial by fire, you see kind of small increments, small deliveries. <clears throat> what is serverless? So this one I decided since I am, you know, not one of those folks, I'll just find somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. Alex Glickson is kind of friend of the family, also um, a veteran in IBM that actually worked on their serverless offering, um, has a lot of insight. I think he had a nice talk. And these are kind of the points that he brought. Um, arbitrary functionality, I do what I want, right? It, it just, it does this for me, uh, whatever it is that I want to put out there. So arbitrary functionality needs to be supported, it's just fine. Uh, shortly, ephemeral uh, instances triggered by events or requests. So we want to be able to have something that starts it uh, on, our, uh, on our terms, and then it just comes up and does what we need it to do. So that's literally what that means. 
uh, high load variability. When you build proof of concept, it's going to be, hey, I sent you that email with the link. Could you click on it because it's pretty awesome, right? So that's going to be your load. It's, it might run like once a day because somebody finally clicked the link. Once you go production, uh, it's going to be you know hundreds of second, thousands of second, whatever it is. Uh, so this needs to support that. Relatively low sensitivity to latency. So that's about us, not about the system, because we, whatever application we build, needs to be okay with sometimes taking maybe a, literally a second to load because it would need to potentially spin up capacity in order to actually process what we request to the process. So variability there, if our application accepts variability, which vast majority of applications do, then this is very much acceptable. Um, and seamless integration of multiple event sources, we need to be able to just start it from various places. Is it a REST endpoint? Is it something that should cause ETL to process whatever it is, it needs to support kind of multiple ways to start it. Um, and, uh, you know, stateless, stateless is going to come out multiple times. It's stateless until it's not, until your life comes, right? So the idea of stateless is basically, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's basically like uh, if you call it twice and don't expect it to remember something the first time inside of the actual instance that you can pick up second time, right? That's the real stateless. Everything else, we, we save things somewhere to be able to recall them from somewhere, I and mean, that's what CRUD is about, right? And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of what that is about. Um, so getting off the ground, nice little view of Manhattan there, you can really see it, but whatever it is. Um, so starting there, that's really all it is. I even included the, you know, putting in your own Python environment, very opinionated. Uh, it was before I knew anything about Python, so I just did this thing, right? <laughs> and so, like, the key values there is you do a style chalice uh, into your environment, that's the library, and then you go, hey, chalice, make me a new project, I just call it sample project. Oh yeah. All right. <laughs> so, uh, so when you run that, it, it's going to drop a few things into your uh, project folder. Immediately, they are very relevant pieces that are going to kind of define the rest of uh, your existence and move things forward. You got your app.py. That's your entry, uh, and it's uh, it's their convention that you don't believe it's configurable, so there isn't like a string that can modify it. You just use app.py. That's where you're going to put your entry into everything. Um, then you go your requirement 60, so it's a little bit important. Usually requirement 60, it's nice to have until you actually, you know, hand it off to somebody and stuff like that. Here it's actually quite important because uh, it is going to be building a package from the ground up and it is going to look into that to understand what library it needs to carry, put into that package to deliver the package into AWS. So make sure you keep it up to date because otherwise as soon as you deploy it, it's going to go, I, I don't know what you're trying to ask me to import here, right? So then we have that chalice link, right? It's nice little hidden um, folder there. Uh, so that one is for configs and artifacts. Uh, you can pick that JSON is where we're going to be looking into that one um, a fair bit uh, because that's where you're going to be doing your custom configuration and kind of various adjustments, and that's where everything goes uh, that you want to do uh, for deployments. And then the deployments folder is artifacts folder. Um, it's really artifacts for chalice purely. I haven't found anything that. Uh, you could say, hey, could you deploy that particular artifact? You would just go like, hey, deploy that particular environment and then put, do that reaching into that folder for you. So it's really more storage for it than for us. So let's take a look at uh, you know, what's, what, what's an app that right? That's like straight up class. If you guys have seen that, right? It's, it's, nothing, it's nothing particularly magical. We spin up, uh, you know, we import Chalice, we spin up an app, we give it a route, and then we return a dictionary, and guess what? It turned it into JSON. All right, so uh, <laughs> then we got our, yeah, we, ha we have a convention, okay, instead of angle brackets, we have a squiggly brackets, but kind of that approach <coughs> is the same. Make sure you name them the same, I color them the same so that it's clear. Um, and then, you know, kind of play with that. That one is relatively straightforward, and you expand from there. Then um, we also have capability of supporting post and various other verbs, and we also go into our current request. It's, really quite similar to everything else that's being kind of done out there. Right, so it's kind of nice because it's, it, it immediately gives you familiarity for what you're trying to accomplish there. So there are plenty of other event sources. I'm being very brief on that. Uh, there's a little bit of difference in kind of what parameters get passed in and get passed to the entire event and blah, blah, blah. But the event sources that are supported. So there's scheduler, right? So that's actually 
why I picked this thing up initially because I needed to spin up a quick reporting uh, reporting utility that would take you that would spin um, schedule every uh, it, that would that would send out the report every every day and so that well, that was kind of my first entry to that it does the uh, S3 events so whatever you know upload the picture turn it into uh, thumbnail things like that. So we have single notification service runs on top of that. You spin up the topic, you can run things on top of topic. Uh, single query service, everything in Amazon is apparently very simple. So that going on, so we can, you know, simple queue service. My bad. Uh, so we can, you know, we can run actually things of the queue. So you can see already how we can build a, a relatively uh, interesting and intense, uh, you know, ETL process where we pick up a file, we fit several things through it, pass notifications. You know, so it's it's it really kind of gives you or get that opportunity out of the gate. And there are actually plenty of other libraries that support various other events that would uh, trigger. So um, one thing is still not, it's not super trivial, but it is sufficiently straightforward. There are uh, instructions on how to do this coming from Amazon. So the, you have to have AWS CLI tools. It rides on top of that to um, make this happen. You need to have those installed. You need to have your free AWS account created. Uh, Need to have admin account credentials, so so you you need these pieces and then configure those credentials. All of that is actually very well documented within those instructions. You need to have that to have the channel to have permissions to put stuff out, and that's if you're spinning up your own accounts, drawing out your own thing. If you have you know if if you're in an organization where they trust you enough to have a you know some form of sandbox for you, just they'll give you the credentials and play from there. So and then you just do this. That's it. it. You do shallow deploying it, and it will literally lift everything from your folder, and it will put it up there. And then it does creating deployment package, put in the zip file, creating uh, IAM role. It will create a special role to give you all the right permissions. You honestly don't need to know what it means out of the gate. It just does it for you. Things work, and they work in properly isolated, secure way. It, it, you know, the impact is very narrow. Uh, creating Lambda function, it will do that for you. Creating REST API, it actually stands up API. Gateway does all these things again. I'm just kind of spelling this out. You don't need to know it ahead of time for this thing to just have it. Oh, yeah, please. Really okay. uh, so, <laughs> and the resource deployed is going to say, oh, by the way, you have this Lambda with this full ARN identifier deployed, and then this is your URL. This is literally the URL you can share out in the game. In fact, I think I have, I like this one up. So, yeah, you can put it in the run. Uh, the hello world. <laughs> Alright, so let's take a look at the local host that's not serverless, right? So how in the world do we actually test this and how do we run it locally? <laughs> uh, I have no idea what that struggle thing is, by the way, so that's my picture. <laughs> um, so uh, local host and local services. So it's not reasonable to deploy to uh, AWS to test every time. Uh, we've been to TDD and we review really results for it, right? So let's take a look at that. Yeah, pretty disappointed just to run showers locally. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it will spin up the server for you, and you know, for it, it handles. So for REST, you you're there. It it just it just does it for you. You hit the endpoint, you debug your code. It's it's actually pretty wonderful in that sense. Um, uh, the, oh yeah, forget me. Wait, is that, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, developing and testing workers. So the, with workers, it gets a little bit trickier, right? Because you don't necessarily have an S3 to trigger the event and things like that. So we have a couple of approaches, right? One one of the good old trials and in anterior design. I'll dive into it because you probably might <laughs> know it by a different name. Onionizing. I'm not sure what other ones are. Uh, you know, we want to run a unit test, pi test. Uh, the other thing that I resorted to was click library, just generating reports, triggering them locally to have them sent through email, so like trigger the whole chain, and then from that point, just you know, doing enough testing and verifying that. So we'll just cover that. Yeah, so NTR design is literally just layering your code and breaking it down into kind of parts and pieces. Um, the big part there is isolating your context. So everything that uh, pertains to request, everything that pertains to kind of chalice things that come in to the endpoints, um, separate them from uh, your part of code that, that gets, you know, that runs your flow that has business logic, pull that to a separate function, and then whatever that stuff returns, put that into return result and return that. Uh, that's all that really means. So just kind of a tiny, you know, example I'm sure you guys have seen various things like that. You know, you have your create user, you create user service that create user, 
and you do stuff there. Well, so there's a little trick. You see that little chalice with service on top. So we'll take a look at how in the world we actually modularize this thing so that the whole package gets carried in because there's a little bit of a convention there as well. Uh, the click library, uh, completely, there, there have been plenty of wonderful tutorials, plenty of uh, lectures on that. Do check it out if you haven't already. Um, and the idea there is that we were talking about separating that user service create user, right? So you just make a separate method that you can that can write along in your code. It will never get called from within Lambda. It can just reside there, right? And then you can call it locally to trigger that particular event. But then when you um, you know when when you are outside of that outside of that environment, then it runs in AWS. It just kind of lays around there and it does nothing. But your service will still get called from other pieces of code. Um, so splitting work into modules. So this is where the chalice leave folder comes in. So you literally create a specific folder called chalice leave inside your app, and I'll, I'll show a little bit the structure in a second. And then all you do is just import chalice leave dot whatever your folder is dot whatever your module is. Import name of the class, right? And so it just what it will do. It will literally leave everything in that folder and carry it with it for you. Uh, I actually put like. SQL files in there so that like my queries were very extensive, so I just drop them in there, just pick them up and carry them, it was fine. So it's it, it literally packages that folder. So that's kind of the structure of you. So you have that chalice and then you add manually by yourself chalice sleeve and put your stuff in there. It kind of runs from there. Uh, so I think that thing is about 17 stories tall. It's one of the tallest blue screens. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so delivering the real product, right? So this is where we kind of go into production, putting this. Uh, yeah, retaining state. That's very important. It's you know, it's not good without bacon. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, the deal is that because we're within a, uh, AWS, we do have access to all these resources, and in fact, we can meaningfully configure them and connect to them from within just our code. At this point, it's just our code, right? We have both of three, we can connect to these various resources. We have, you know, we can carry some additional libraries, connect to our DS, we can do all of those things. Uh, some restrictions do apply, that's gonna be like the wording at the end, so I better hurry up. Uh, so special third party payloads, um, this is me watching Crane being built, it's pretty awesome. Um, so, we did go, yes. All right, so uh, one of the things was that, um, I had a segpg that I needed to carry into this deployment. Segpg does have uh, C libraries that come with it. They needed to be proper, um, uh, what you call it, they need to be proper binaries, need to be built with it. So I um, had to do a little bit of uh, dancing around. The key feature there is that there is another important folder that's called vendor folder. So you need to drop any kind of stuff, you just uh, install it locally into that folder. Other trick that was there, there was another talk about um, uh, Docker and so on and so forth for development environment. I had to play with Docker a little bit and spin up the instance of Docker of proper Linux, um, proper Linux environment so that the full proper libraries and so on and so forth. So this is a bit tricky. I've left my handle. If any one of you guys runs into that madness, I'm more than happy to walk you through it. It was a bit painful, but it's not too, too terrible. Um, uh, then, uh, the, what should call it? Some patterns might be included. I believe Bother 3 already comes with this thing, so you don't necessarily have to include it in the requirements. And then requests, I think it's for requests, uh, is already included. So, so some libraries just, you could include them, I don't think it would matter, but I don't, some libraries you don't necessarily have to include. Just kind of uh, uh, pointing it out. <laughs> We're environment friendly, uh, as many environments are possible and supported. Uh, my Scrum Master, <laughs> that's IoT Cloud, that's actual cloud, we call it Cloud Cloud. Um, <laughs> so, in terms of the common uh, CD workflow, so as you see, uh, there is no uh, there is no CI uh, per se. So there is no like clear CI support there. You can write your own tests. You can uh, you know do the deployments, their deployment process and stuff like that. So it will support multiple environments and kind of let you play with that. But there isn't like CI built into <coughs> the whole thing. But you can do continuous deployment from command line. So, uh, but it, it does support deployment multiple environments. So. Um, all of this is managed in uh, that chalice config JSON file, right? So a little bit of kind of jump into that. Just the important part: there is a subset <coughs> called stages, and under that there is um, QA 
you know, and then you go into kind of that breakdown, you can have the environment variables, and so on and so forth. There'll be another example with actual um, kind of um, settings in there. Uh, so yeah, with multiple environments, the cool part is that once you put that into configuration, the variance in deployment is basically say child is deployed at their first stage and tell the environment you want to deploy to, and it will do the thing for you. So that's that's very neat, and I've definitely leveraged that. Um, all right, security um, all the way. So that's kind of where we're coming into the hole in real life and going like, hey, yes, we can do it because it's going to be fine and we can secure, make it as secure as anything else within our system. Um, uh, so a little bit of diving. Uh, so identity and access management roles. So this thing creates one for you out of the gate and it's going to tell you, hey, you can actually uh, you know, connect to uh, API gateway. You can... Uh, you know, it, it will give you all kinds of various permissions out of the gate that it just needs to stand up the infrastructure, right? Uh, it, um, yeah, the permissions within roles. And then, um, you know, so, and then you can go, hey, I actually want to uh, be able to read right from DynamoDB, I want to only read from S3 buckets, things like that, right? So, so that's kind of the purpose of that thing, is giving you general ability to access certain resources in various ways. Uh, so the key thing is that, just to remember, if you, uh, if you find the need to customize it, which means you're probably trying to access some kind of custom, um, which goes some kind of custom, um, you know, capabilities in AWS, the idea is to copy the thing that it creates by default for you first, and then add to it. Because it, it, it will create few weird things, and obviously with updates, it's gonna have few newer ones. So, um, virtual <coughs> private cloud, I kind of like this analogy, so you have this uh, kind of inside uh, of the apartment building and close, and there's also a door that leads into it, so that's your virtual private cloud, right? So you have to have access to the whole thing in order to be able to uh, work with it. And so um, uh, if it is capable, you are able to tie in Lambda with your VPC. So if you have your database server hanging inside this, you know, inside the cloud, you can actually legitimately configure this thing to tie into that and hit your database and do all kinds of things. And so it's pretty great. And so you know you, you go get into your you know production and then you have capability of like configuring subnet IDs and security group IDs and things like that. This is just there again. This is the it doesn't tell you exactly what this is, this is the guiding post that you are able to do this and it's you know legitimate capable of going into your production and tying into anything you need to do there. So uh, uh, an API gateway that's another thing it's actually quite well documented. So once you have the API and you say, hey, if this individual comes in, I want them to only access the information about this organization and not other organizations, right? So we're talking about multi-tenancy, that type of stuff. So there are, it, you know, it ties into any kind of third-party providers. It's cap you are capable of building your own the documentation is quite abundant. Uh, uh, sometimes, you, uh, you know, you can take the hard way, and that was my problem. I was trying to connect to a database, and I was I didn't want to keep credential database in the environment variables, so I just decided to go with uh, like uh, in, in Secret Manager. Secret Manager is another AWS feature. I could not for life for me to figure out how to do it through configuration. Some systems allow you to do it. I couldn't figure out how to do it here. We have both the three, so I just said, hey, how about you just go and get your stuff. Yeah, I just, I just wrote it plain in code and pulled it in, and so the password was pulled upon each request. Not the most efficient thing. I was running it once a day. Didn't care. <laughs> right. So within this application, it was okay. Sometimes you just you just kind of called your way out of it. Uh, so uh, pros and cons and hidden obstacles on this. One of the important things: this sucker will scale, right? Like. If you unleash something on it, it will just go horizontal. The one thing that Amazon does for you is defaults it to 50, uh, 50 of the instances, right? So it doesn't want you to go broke. If you hit something wrong first time around, it'll go, you got 50, that's the value that you got. If you say, would you take that off? They will take that off. And it will, I mean, it, they build you in 100 uh, millisecond increments, and they charge you like tiny fractions of a penny, but you could spin this thing out and go crazy with it. And so, it will scale around the important thing is that if you stack up things like in you know, RDS instances you have database routing, it has limited number of connections. This thing will eat all of your connections for lunch and then some, you know, bring things down, it's true power. If you want to load test something, hey, here you go. You know, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it's definitely one of the kind of key things to be aware of. 
yeah, and it's, but the cool part is that, again, it charges in tiny increments, and so it's very expensive. So in conclusion, um, challenges begin a friend. So even though I threw all this crazy stuff at you, you don't have to have it. It is, it lets you take stuff into production, but you, again, if you just want to play with it, just do it and you can stay within the comfortable, simple boundaries, just showing your work and playing with easy stuff and just getting to some cool AWS stuff. Um, uh, learn new environment as you go. Uh, I did not know most of this when I started. I just needed to do the next thing, and so I did the next thing and discovered this, right? Um, Leverage the full scale of AWS and customize everything, which you can do. And then don't let the about destroy you. Yeah, just, that's, that's what I said in the beginning. Uh, in scaling is great until it just burns everything. And, and that's what I